Astronomy to GCSE, Topic 4.3, Cosmology. So 1. Doppler Principle, Redshift and Blueshift. I would recommend watching this short video by Alt Shift X. It's a well visualised animation of Doppler Shift. If an object is emitting waves like sound or light, for example this face is emitting sound, if the object is emitting waves and moving towards you, those waves get compressed because the emitter is moving in the direction of the wave. Likewise, if the emitter is moving away from you, the waves get stretched. With visible light, longer wavelengths mean more red, shorter wavelengths are more blue. So if an emitter of visible light is moving away, then the light gets shifted more to the red. Likewise, if an emitter is moving towards you, the light appears more blue. This is called blue shift and red shift. You can notice it every day with an approaching ambulance. The pitch changes when it reaches you and begins to go further away. This is due to Doppler shift of its sound waves. The faster the emitter recedes, so moves away, the longer the wavelengths become and the more red they look. The faster the emitter approaches, the more blue it looks. When we look at the distant galaxies, we see that their light is shifted to the red. This is not them being cooler, it's the actual light is shifted to the red. If we collect a spectrum of light from a star, we will notice lines of light of particular wavelengths which are associated with certain elements. These can be shifted towards the red. As these lines are associated with a particular element, we know exactly what colour they should be and if they are collected from a star with red shifted light, the colours will all be more red. Depending on how red shifted, so how far to the red side of the spectrum they are, depends on how fast the star or galaxy is receding. So by measuring the amount of red shift of light, we can calculate how fast a galaxy is receding. There is an equation that you need to be able to use which connects the shift in wavelength of light to how fast a galaxy is receding, so moving away. The wavelength from the star is represented by lambda. Now this may be red or blue shifted. The wavelength at rest, which is measured in a laboratory on Earth, is represented by lambda zero. It's important that you don't get those two confused. V is the radial velocity of the galaxy. This is a fancy word for the recession velocity, so how fast the galaxy is receding. C is the speed of light, which is 300,000 kilometers per second. So if we're wanting to find a change in the measured wavelength, which is from the galaxy or star, we want the difference between lambda from lambda zero. So what we do is we minus lambda zero from lambda. We now get a number telling us how much longer the new wavelength is. A positive number is red shifted as the wave will be longer and a negative number is blue shifted as the wavelength will be shorter and compressed. We now get the fraction of the original wavelength this change is. So we divide so we can see if the red shift is a change of a hundredth or a thousand let's say. So we divide by the stationary wavelength because that's the wavelength it should be. If you like the original wavelength without any Doppler shift. Now this fraction is equal to the radial velocity, which is how fast the galaxy is receding, divided by the speed of light. So let's do an example. You should be given the equation in the exam, so you don't have to remember it, but you do have to remember what each of the symbols mean. A big one is remembering that lambda zero is the stationary wavelength. I like to think of it as lambda when the velocity is zero. I find that helps. Okay, so a question. An astronomer observes a wavelength of a spectral line in a spectrum uh, of a galaxy as 620 nanometers. Nanometers um, is represented by nm, it's a millionth of a millimeter. The same spectral line has the wavelength 510 nanometers when at rest. The speed of light is 300,000 kilometers a second, determine the recession velocity. In case you were wondering, C is always the same at 300,000 kilometers a second. Now, remember the rest wavelength is lambda at velocity zero, so lambda zero. Let's re rearrange the equation before we put our numbers into it and compute an answer. 
we want just the velocity so we need to move the speed of light onto the other side as the velocity is divided by c we want to times both sides by z which means we end up with the velocity being equal to the difference in wavelengths times by the speed of light all divided by the stationary wavelengths if we put the values in we get 620 minus 510 which equals 110 now if we put 300,000 times 110 and divided by 510 into the calculator we get 65,000 to two significant figures now what are the units the speed of light was in kilometers a second so that is the unit that the recession velocity is in two so this galaxy was moving away at 65,000 kilometers per second. Two, galaxies with blue shift. So if galaxies with red shift are receding, then approaching galaxies will be blue shifted. The galaxies in our local group are actually blue shifted. So Andromeda, the Triangulum Galaxy, are all approaching us. These handful of galaxies are the only ones in the whole universe that are approaching us all others are moving away. This is because the universe is expanding. 3. The discovery of quasars. Quasars are a type of active galactic nuclei. These are covered in 4.2. All quasars are ancient. They are some of the earliest galaxies in the universe. They are also very far away and receding very quickly, which gives them very large redshift. This large redshift was used by astronomers to discover them. Quasars are strong radio sources, so they were first discovered by a radio telescope. The first quasar, called 3C273, was discovered by the radio telescope at Cambridge. The precise location of 3C273, the radio source, was obtained by lunar occultation, where the moon passes in front of the object. Now knowing exactly where the radio sources were coming from, astronomers could link the radio source to a light source. Once they knew which visible light source was producing these huge quantity of radio waves, they could obtain a spectrum of the star. The star was highly redshifted, which meant that it was receding very quickly. This implied that it was very far away. To be that bright, but that far away, this suggested that the star was not in fact a star, once they realised this, they named it 3C2, they named 3C273 the first quasar. 4. Hubble's Law Hubble noticed that most of the galaxies, apart from a handful, were all redshifted and moving away from us. He also noticed that galaxies further away seemed to be moving away faster than those that were closer. Hubble concluded that the universe was expanding, the fact that the galaxies further away had a higher velocity is evidence for an expanding universe. Hubble decided to plot a graph with the distances to galaxies in megaparsecs on the x-axis and res recession velocity in kilometres a second on the y-axis, and he came up with an amazing find. The relationship between velocity and distance was linear and proportional. In fact, you can say that v is proportional to d, and the way you write this in maths is with an alpha. So this means that v is proportional to d. The other way you can write this is with a constant of proportionality. In maths we usually use k, but here it's a specific constant, it's the Hubble constant, which is represented by h. So what is the constant? It's the gradient of the line of best fit on the graph as that is the factor between the velocity and the distance. So you can use the equation to determine the distance of the galaxy if you know the recession velocity. You'll be given Hubble's constant in the exam, but it's around 75. It's difficult to know exactly, it's the line of best fit, uh, and because it's a line of best fit and more data is being found all the time. Because Hubble's constant is the ratio between velocity in kilometers a second and distance in megaparsecs, the unit for Hubble's constant is kilometers per second per megaparsec. So, if we use our galaxy earlier, that was receding at 65,000 kilometers a second, using Hubble's law, how distant is it? We want d by itself. 
So if we divide both sides of the equation by Hubble's constant h, we get d is equal to v divided by h. So if we have 65,000 kilometers a second as a velocity, and let's say Hubble's constant is 75, you may get a different value on the day, so watch out. We have the distance being equal to 65,000 divided by 75, which is around 867 megaparsecs to three significant figures. So that is how you use Hubble's law to calculate the distance to galaxies. One thing that can catch people out um, is that the equation uses velocity in kilometers a second, but gives distances in megaparsecs. As long as you remember that, that should be all right, as it gives you the formula for the Hubble's constant. Five, the age of the universe. So if the other galaxies are moving away from us, apart from those in our local group, then there must have been once a beginning where all the galaxies were in one place. This beginning is called the Big Bang. To calculate how old the universe is, then we need to work out how long ago the Big Bang was. In fact, surprisingly, Hubble's constant can help us. The Hubble constant is the ratio between the recession velocity and the distance, so we can use it to calculate the age of the universe, which is the time when everything was in one place. If we think about the units of the Hubble constant, then it will make more sense. We have velocity in kilometers a second, and then divide that by megaparsecs. This gives us kilometers divided by seconds times by megaparsecs. Notice that there is a distance unit on the top and the bottom of the fraction, kilometers and megaparsecs. If you convert the units so that they're the same, then they'll actually cancel out, even ye leaving you one over seconds. If you take the reciprocal of that fraction, you'll get seconds. So just by reordering the Hubble's constant, we get the number of seconds that is the age of the universe. If you convert this to years, you get about 13.8 billion years. You don't need to be able to convert the Hubble constant into the age of the universe, you just need to be able to describe how it's done. Six, cosmic microwave background radiation. In 1965, two American radio astronomers, Penzias and Wilson, were working at the Horn radio antennae when they accidentally found a strange hissing noise that occurred at all times from all areas of the sky. This was later discovered to be the cosmic microwave background, a radiation that was a remnant from the Big Bang and is evidence for the Big Bang rather than any other theory for how the universe began. The cosmic microwave background used to be at a much higher frequency when it was younger and since it has been redshifted as the universe has expanded after the Big Bang. As the wavelength of the cosmic microwave background has got longer, it cooled and it's now associated with being about 3 Kelvin and that is the temperature of outer space. There have been modern attempts to map the cosmic microwave background radiation. This one was called WMAP. These experiments have allowed astronomers to analyze minute ripples in the cosmic microwave background, which are represented by the color changes in the image. These measurements of the cosmic microwave background have helped astronomers to refine models of the early universe, like the Big Bang theory. It has also allowed astronomers to estimate the contribution of dark matter and dark energy in the universe. 7. Past evolution of the universe and the Big Bang Physicists are not currently sure what went on before the Big Bang. From time zero they know that the universe started and began to expand rapidly. At this point the universe was very condensed and very hot. After about 380,000 years, the cosmic microwave background was formed. Since then, it has been shifted into the microwave part of the spectrum. It is also cooled to 3 Kelvin. At the beginning, it was around 3,000. So what evidence do we have for the Big Bang? The cosmic microwave background has cooled to 3 Kelvin as the universe has expanded as a result of the Big Bang. Quasars are also evidence for the Big Bang and show that the early universe was very different from the current universe today. 8. Different evolutionary models of the universe. So if you like, these are alternatives to the Big Bang. There are three main models of the universe that you need to know about. Steady state, cyclic model and the Big Bang. 
the steady state theory suggests that the universe is expanding forever. However, that new matter is continually being made such that the density of the universe is constant. This theory has little evidence and does not predict a finite age of the universe. In a cyclic model, the universe expands forever before slowing down and eventually returning to one point. This happens again and again and again. Each expansion is called a big bang and each contraction a big crunch. In the cyclic model, this bang followed by crunch happens forever. The currently accepted theory is the Big Bang, that the universe expands and either continues expanding forever or collapses back down in a big crunch, but only once. It is difficult to find a perfect model, as we do not know exactly what will happen in the future, and it can be hard to work out what went on in the past. 9. Dark Matter and Dark Energy by looking at the stars and galaxies that we can see, there is not enough gravity to hold them together. By using just what we can see, the galaxies will just fall apart and not form in the first place. So if with just what we can see, galaxies fall apart, then there must be something else out there that we can't see. As galaxies don't fall apart, they actually exist. Physicists have called this matter that we cannot see dark matter. In fact, dark matter isn't just a little bit of matter, it is estimated that dark matter and dark energy make up over 90% of the universe. As dark matter slows down the expansion of the universe with increased gravity, if there's enough of it, the eventually the expansion could stop and result in a collapse of the universe and a big crunch. After some observations, astronomers noticed that the universe is not only expanding, but it's accelerating, so it's expanding faster and faster and faster as time goes on. Dark energy was introduced to explain how the universe seems to be accelerating. Depending on the balance of dark matter and energy in the universe will depend on whether we continue expanding forever or whether it will collapse in a big crunch. We know little about dark matter and even less about dark energy. There are a few contenders for dark matter though, like black holes and neutrinos. That is the end of Astronomy to GCSE 4.3 Cosmology, and it's also the end of my series of 15 videos. So thank you very much for watching me throughout this, and hope you do well.